Welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, airing live Monday nights on KGRARadio.com and now as a podcast on iTunes and wherever else you can find it. You can learn more at my member site, richarddolanmembers.com. Now, join me for a fascinating exploration of all the things you secretly want to talk about, from UFOs to government shenanigans, strange science, future tech, and more. Here on KGRA Radio, welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Greetings. It's August 6, 2018. Very glad to be with you once again here in the heat of summer in the Northern Hemisphere. It's a good time to remind ourselves of the natural world around us beyond the reading and writing and the incessant talking that marks a typical day for me. I've been getting into gardening, really, for the first time in my life. It's one way, a good one, to reconnect with nature, something that I think we sorely need in our world. It's all too easy for most of us to forget that we don't come from a concrete jungle or a suburban dystopia or even a suburban utopia, if you happen to feel that way about where you live. We live in a highly manicured, landscaped environment, one that, in fact, we have been adapting to our needs as a species for many thousands of years. It so happens that we've developed institutions in the last couple of hundred years that have really made that capability extra powerful. So we live in an environment increasingly sculpted by the human mind forgetting most of the time that, in fact, we are creatures of the earth who for many thousands of years, many, many thousands of years, lived in harmony with the natural world, a world that uh, I would say is increasingly at risk just because we are, well, human beings with very advanced technology. Where that will ultimately lead us is something I think about a lot, as I'm sure many of you do as well. I'm thinking these thoughts in part because of my guest tonight, that is Gordon White, author of a very fine book indeed, which we will discuss, and someone with insights into human prehistory that make him really worth listening to, in my opinion. His analysis on the ancient archaeological site of Gobekli Tepe alone is probably the best I've ever encountered, ever. But Gordon has a lot more to say about early human history, including a lot on the subject of ancient aliens. I think you will find his take on it to be very compelling and certainly very thought-provoking and quite possibly closer to the truth than what we've heard um, from a lot of other people on the subject. Before I bring Gordon on, I want to remind you that if you want to follow what I'm doing, you can go to a few places. First is my new website, richardolanmembers.com, where I provide ongoing analyses of UFOs, geopolitics, false flags, and much more in the form of video, audio, blog posts, I'm adding content to that site several times a week. It's grown rapidly, so lots to see there. Go visit sometime and see what I'm up to. Also, check my check my traditional site of richardolanpress.com, where I have books written by myself, many other fascinating authors, including a new publication this week by Dr. Bruce Maccabee. Definitely find me on my YouTube channel, where I'm putting up new content every week, including my new series of live stream videos called Intelligent Disclosure, where I give... Uh, many lectures on a wide range of subjects, and am joined by my wife, Tracy, who chimes in and fields live questions. And of course, you can continue to find me here on KGRE Radio every week doing this show. So without any further waiting, let me bring on my guest, a fascinating pre-recorded discussion with Gordon White. Gordon White, thanks for joining me on the program tonight. How are you? I'm well, I'm well. Very happy to be here. It's a pleasure to talk with you again. Uh, people ought to know that we, you and I met in person and uh, about two months ago when we spent a full week together with a nice, a very wonderful group of people in uh, the center of Australia. We did. We attended a surprise wedding. <laughs> yeah, yeah my, mine and Tracy's. Uh, that's a whole other story. And in fact, I just have to say your tweet of that was the best. It was the best tweet. Uh, I can't remember exactly what you said, but it was uh, really funny and um, very apropos. And so, it was, yeah, well, it was a it was a great afternoon, and you know, the sunset and the weather and Uluru in the background. Uh, you guys, you guys do good surprise weddings. Well, you, you know, I'll just say this: so Tracy and I went. We went to uh, 
Uluru, at the center of Australia, to meet you and meet um, a number of people uh, who were really organized by Catherine Austin Fitz, who I think listeners of, the, of this program know who she is. I've interviewed Catherine, and we've known each other for years. But so uh, the, the funny thing is this: the wedding was a surprise not simply to you guys but to Tracy and me because, as we've said a few times, we didn't really know until three days before we went to Australia if she would be able to go. It was a, a huge uh, issue with U.S. immigration, which I'll spare everyone the details, but it was not clear to us. And when we realized that we could go, we decided we would have this wedding ceremony But what we didn't want to do was get in everyone's way, uh, which was really funny because we discovered that everyone in this group was like, no, no, please, we want to be there. So it turned out to be really a lot of fun. And and we were so glad that you were there. Oh, thank you. It it was wonderful. And I would really like people to know um, more about you. Um, I have to say that my meeting you in person two months ago was my introduction to you. I didn't know anything about your work previously. I did not know what an absolutely brilliant writer you are, and I am going to say that because it's true, Um, and just how interesting you are. So uh, it was kind of a shock to me, to be honest with you, when I first began talking with you and hearing you uh, just go off on ancient human history, and like within the first 10 seconds, I thought, this guy knows a tremendous amount about uh, early human origins and uh, probably so much more. So what is what is the story that you would like to tell listeners about yourself? And um, we we know from your website, which is Rune Soup, um, mm-hmm. RuneSoup dot com, is it? That's the one. Com, that you're a practicing magician. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have been for a while now. Yep. Yeah. So you're into a lot of different things. And how would you like to introduce all of that to listeners? Because I think you can do well, it far the- better than I could. <laughs> well, it's sort of funny. So I'm uh, Rune Soup is is a blog and also a weekly podcast, and uh, so I'm kind of friendly with other podcasters who are in or operating in adjacent vineyards, if you will. Um, and so there's Greg Carlwood at High Side Chats, for instance, and uh, Alex Sakiris at Skeptico are two main ones. And what's sort of fascinating, and it's something we discuss when we're in the desert, and you say fairly often, which is if you spend enough time with ufology, you end up in philosophy because the implications of the sort of field are uh, like literally cosmic or philosophical. And so Greg kind of came down a conspiracy route and Alex came down a sci research, NDE research kind of route. And obviously I came at it from magic. And you kind of know when you're in a space that is ready to you're in the right space for analysis and research and so on when they kind of combine because, you know, they, as you're well aware, the history of the twentieth century kind of moves in and out of conspiracy when it comes to UFOs and mm-hmm. Psy Research and MK Ultra and so on. So it doesn't really matter kind of what road you come down. Mine was magic. Um, I've uh, sort of had some unusual experiences as a kid. And then one day when I was 13, kind of one Saturday, sat bolt upright in bed uh, one Saturday morning and was aware. I don't remember the dreams, but I had some kind of intense dream experience and uh, stole some money from my mother's purse because I was 13 and didn't have any and uh, walked a couple of miles down the hill to an independent bookstore in, in Newcastle, Australia, which is where I grew up. The bookstore is gone, like all good independent bookstores. Yes, yeah, sadly. And I bought a bunch of books and a pack of cigarettes, because, again, 13, <laughs> uh, and sort of sat in a grandstand and, and read some very, what aren't actually very good magic books, it turns out, 20 years later. Um, and, and it was sort of off to the races for me uh, with that kind of stuff. Um, as for the interest in antiquity, uh it kind of emerged. My father, well, my grandfather was part of colonial administration in Nauru and New Guinea. So my father grew up there and my aunt is New Guinean and so on. So the ancient Pacific is particularly interesting to me. And uh, my father kind of can't go a year without heading somewhere into the islands to kind of soak up that that childhood memory stuff. So I've been diving all over the Pacific and, and this kind of thing. And uh, it was in the 90s when, so I, I, I got hooked or poisoned maybe uh, by Graham Hancock when uh, his books and TV series, in particular Fingerprints of the Gods, came out in the mid-90s. And so that was it for me. 
um, that was where I kind of began looking at extended human timelines and what the actual research is available. And it does, because again, much like ufology ends up in philosophy, if you do these things like magic and esotericism, and you're also looking at the history of mankind and the planet and so on, you, you actually really, these are all um, blind men's hands on the same elephant, if that makes sense. So they, they do. Yes, exactly. It might sound unusual, but it, it kind of isn't. It just depends on what road you get to as you approach the mystery, I suppose. Would you explain that for, for listeners? I mean, I think many people understand that analogy of the blind men and the elephant, but uh, I, I feel ufology is a, a perfect description of that analogy. Yeah, it's uh, it's originally a sort of it's a Hindu motif, yeah. and it's uh, and the the elephant is reality, and so there are sort of five blind men trying to describe reality, and one of them's um, got a hold of one of the legs, and it says it's it's, it's this thick um, tree like thing, and mm-hmm. one's got the tail, and one's got the ear, and one's got the actual trunk. Yeah, and one says and it's a rope, all... and another says it's uh, yeah, uh, a and horn. so they're arguing yeah. about what reality is Mm -hmm. because they've got one piece of it. And it's just one of those really nice ideas that uh, is useful to bear in mind when you're, I don't know, arguing on the internet about something. (laughs) For sure. For sure. Um, Oh, just fascinating. And so uh, I, I want to um, talk about your book, which I'm holding in my hand called Starships. And um, I've only read about, as I said uh, earlier before we started here, uh, about 50 pages, but the subtitle is A Prehistory of the Spirits. I don't know any book like this. And um, one one thing that is absolutely astonishing about this book to me is your description of the, uh, histor- the archaeological site of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. And I feel that this is the best writing on Gobekli Tepe I've ever encountered. Not that I'm an expert on Gobekli Tepe, but I have read a few things about it. And I have never read anything uh, deeper or more insightful, uh, more thought-provoking, and more elucidating on Gobekli Tepe than what I've read in your book. And so for that reason alone, I really believe people need to be reading your book, um, anyone who's interested in human origins and prehistory. But can you describe uh, this book for listeners and for me, since I haven't read all of it myself, <laughs> Starships, <laughs> sure. um, what, what's it all about and what, what prompted you to write this and, and what is this book and what do you say in it? Well, it's a it's it's a coming together of my interest in, you know, antediluvia, so the kind of Graham Hancock stuff, uh, and my interest in magic because w- particularly when it comes to things like quote-unquote ancient aliens, it's always i've always found it a bit frustrating that if you look at the program for instance they just kind of play bingo up and down the timeline and they're at borobudur or it's it's like a 16th century carving in india and it's a question mark did aliens do this and you go well probably not actually so it it, if we're to look at the off-world and extra-dimensional interaction with mankind over the entire story of mankind what you kind of need to do is Reset the baseline. Look at what the available linguistic and genetic and and everything else evidence that we have about the movement of human populations and ideas around the world are and kind of get a clear view of that and then look at where the uh, where the anomalous emerges. So it's called Starships, like with the dot in the middle, because it kind of traces um, star law and and mankind's kind of storytelling and interaction with the stars back about 70,000 years. So pretty much since we left Africa sometime between 70 and 90,000 years ago. Yeah. Uh, because that's the most important part that, that I, I tend to find frustrating in, in the kind of um, Venn overlap, Venn diagram overlap between something like ufology and esoterics is uh, anytime someone mentions the stars or star law, people kind of leap to a – um, a sort of physical intervention that does a couple of things. Um, it does a couple of things in the sense that it it sort of diminishes the achievements of our ancestors for a start, mm-hmm. um, but it also stops inquiry rather than furthers inquiry. Now, um, if you got to the end of the book, you say, I, I am an interventionist. Um, I, I think it happened very, very early on in terms of the actual formation of humans. So, you know, 1.5 million years ago, give or take. Right. So in other words, Uh, I just want to jump in. So you are, and as an interventionist, you are stating that you believe there were other intelligences that intervened in some form with humanity going back to our earliest, uh, as far as we can tell. 
Well, I think other intelligences, if we're kind of widening it out to spirits, is an ongoing process. But mm -hmm. I, I'm an interventionist in the sense that I, you cannot explain the appearance of life on this planet without the physical intervention of of actual off-world beings. So directed panspermia and whatever happened with our DNA and so on. Like I, I, right. I'm an interventionist in the, like in a classic UFO sense. I think. Um, but that the the bits that I think the best cases for intervention I think are long before history, even archaeology and, and anthropology and so on. I think we're at the kind of million year plus um, when it comes to mankind. I also, as a result, once you kind of baseline this stuff and you, you sort of look at human history in the wider context of the things that I know you talk about on the show and that Tracy's interested in, mankind's psi capacities and, and all that kind of stuff, when you when you kind of approach it and get a holistic view of the movement of mankind and stories and mythology around the planet and, and realize that mankind does have these capacities. It's at that point that you can start looking for the proverbial flying sources. And I also, once you're there, you say, well, I don't rule it out. Why wouldn't it have happened? But as an explanatory model for things like the rise of Sumer and Egypt, it's uh, physical intervention of people in, or of aliens and nuclear powered rocket ships is just no longer up to code for understanding the, the kind of human journey. I tend to agree with you. And uh, it's funny because I've, I've been on Ancient Aliens a number of times. But you know, it's funny, they never, uh, I've almost never appeared on that show to talk about Ancient Aliens uh, because that show's gone so far beyond uh, just purely ancient astronaut theory anyway. Uh, I mean, it is, a, yeah. it is a TV show after all. So they, they brought me on to talk about a lot of more contemporary things. But I And it's a multi-channel one because I'm ex-Discovery Channel. Um, and so when a multi-channel broadcaster finds a show that kind of has an infinite format. So we had um, Deadliest Catch. That's, that's the era I was at Discovery Channel, right? And this show could run forever because... Like it doesn't change and everyone loved it. And Ancient Aliens is that it's a sort of infinite evergreen format, which is when you have a low production budget and multi-channel broadcasters do, something like Ancient Aliens is uh, is the gift that keeps on giving. It really, really is. It's an amazing show just from a production uh, concept point of view. Uh, they really hit uh, a grand slam home run with with that one with that idea for Be sure because the, it, there's no such thing as repeat or anything because like, it's the same every time it's like deadliest catch you can so each season with your small budget you build the library of stuff that you can just keep running and that's how multi-channel broadcasters make their money so yeah, um, yeah, i don't i don't um begrudge them that at all that's just the nature of the beast that's ex exactly it um but back to uh your concept of intervention um, if I may uh, say, like I jumped ahead through your book. I, I read enough of it to get an idea of what I think you were suggesting. And um, it's there because of your background in magic, I, I think that you're strongly implying that some of these early archaeological sites, for example, at the end of the book, you cited one in um, East Africa, and I'm, in fact, I'm flipping to the pages, but it was a kind of calendar. And it was... Yeah, uh, Naptaplaya. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm looking at Naptaplaya here, and it's something like, uh, I don't know how many thousands of years old, but incredibly old. And you described it as a Stone Age hermetics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think what you're uh, indicating here is that the builders of this particular calendar, if you will, were getting their information uh, very possibly in, through non-physical means. But that, but it was ac accurate yeah. astronomical, galactic astronomical information through non-physical means. Yes. Well, let's look at some of the things we do know from the 20th century. So, for instance, um, the Stargate program and Ingo Swan correctly and firstly identifying rings around Jupiter, uh, which he saw with remote viewing. So we actually know that humans have the capacity to use psi mm -hmm. to learn things about the universe. So these are these are kind of sort of the foundational premises. You kind of pull that data out and, and sort of use it as a light to shine on history. And all of a sudden, you don't need, you know, um, Zechariah Sitchin's little putt-putt um, nuclear rocket ships coming down because right. we have this capacity to learn and in some way interact because that's what remote viewing is. It's some sort of consciousness process that Ingo did with Jupiter and, right. and learned stuff, right? Absolutely. So, when you look back at um, 
sites that do tend to attract the ancient aliens crowns um it's it's better and more parsimonious to go with the things that we actually do know and in, in the case of sci research we have 140 years of lab verified results that we can do telepathy that we can to a limited extent you know um, alter probability we can see things that aren't near here everyone knows this everyone's experienced telephone telepathy and so on so this is a natural functioning process of humans now let's think about how good we would be or were at that um, when there was no electromagnetic radiation, when there was no light pollution in the sky, when we had, I sort of say in the book that for 50,000 years, the only thing on TV was the night sky. Now, when you're in a culture or cultures that relies on these skills for hunter gathering and you are there and all your stories are about this sort of great arc of stars that, you know, is up above you, consider how good they might be at this compared to like we can just sort of glimpse yes. what they might be good at and uh, and that is where i sort of that's why it's called a prehistory of the spirits because i think um it's uh, my intention is to elevate the capacities of our ancestors because we think they were dumb and we think their lives were nasty and brutish and short both wrong you know they have they actually have larger in the paleolithic the brain cavity inside the skull is larger than ours. Yes, so, yes, yes. I've, like, I've heard this as well. Come on. Uh, so the idea that they're somehow dumber than us um, is, doesn't match the available data. And they also required these skills, which we all have, In and they didn't think they were weird. They required these skills whilst hunting and gathering and, and communicating across vast distances. We were just out in the desert, right? So you know what a bull roarer is, um, Richard? Um, I don't think so. A bull roarer? Okay, so it's, it's like a carved <laughs> piece of wood that Australian Aborigines would have on a rope and they'd stand up on a promontory and whir it and it makes this really loud helicopter sound, right? Ah. Now, um, when Europeans first encountered this, they thought it was a method of communication, sort of like um, a, a, an auditory semaphore, like there was a difference in the sounds, but there isn't. It only makes one sound. So these things would roar and if you were on the, uh, like, you know, 20 miles away on the other side of the desert or whatever, you would hear that sound and you would tune in. Like it was, it isn't I a see. telephone call, it's a telephone ring. Okay. And this was a capacity that they would have. So you would hear the bull roarer and then you would essentially engage telepathically with whoever was uh, going to be speaking with you. And this again is a nor this is a thing we've observed in humans for the last 140 years. And in Aboriginal cultures where it's normal, they're better at it. Well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned Ingo Swan earlier, uh, Gordon, because in one of his books, I think it's Superpowers of the Bio-Mind, um, which is a two-volume thing that he wrote, he put out the um, hypothesis that the psi abilities that human beings have, I mean, these things don't happen just accidentally. They happen because there's an evolutionary reason for it, that w there's a need for it. And I think what you're saying is exactly the same thing, that, that um, early human beings living in an era where the night sky was the television uh, in a completely different electromagnetic free environment would have been able to uh, require or benefit from psi abilities to communicate across distances, or at least th this seems to be. What oh, absolutely. Saying. And this I was mean, Ingo's the, the, thesis. The Faraday cage uh, research or experimentation of the Stargate program did. And Ingo in particular said that there was a sort of 200% uplift in accuracy if you were attempting to remote view inside the Faraday cage. Now, you didn't need a Faraday cage 10,000 years ago because there was nothing to Faraday protect from, right? No, right. So just right away, without getting into, well, what are the spirits out there in this? It, it, call them whatever you want. Like once you're out in the stars, it, it might be an intelligence of the stars. It might actually be, as we discussed with the Dogon, uh, it might actually be beings on planets orbiting these stars who are communicating telepathically with us. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter at that point. But just think about on a baseline perspective, we know we have these skills and consider how good they would be when you have tens of thousands of years of practice. Well, and indeed, and, and, consider, and required. consider the people at Nabda Playa, which we were just talking about in East Africa. I want to read one uh, small passage out of your book. Um, first of all, I, I think people will appreciate just how wonderful your writing is. But this is very interesting, and it, it speaks to the ability of these individuals thousands of years ago to gain what appears to be very accurate information about our galaxy. And, and you write here, 
Uh, the bedrock sculpture underneath Complex Structure A at Nabda Playa appears to be an accurate depiction of our Milky Way galaxy as it was oriented astronomically at a specific time, vernal equinox, heliacal rising of the galactic center in 17,700 B.C. Um, so, I mean, and then you go on. You say, the Nabda Playa results are probably the most interesting on a personal level as they strike me as the best match for an hypothesized Laurasian stellar immortality technology or a sort of Stone Age hermetics yeah. um, and describing the well, as-below-so-below so principle. Yes, yeah, so one of the theses in the book is if you are looking for evidence, once you've kind of baselined this, and we were just talking about it with Psy and so on, and before we get there, I'd just like to, if people want to picture the kind of classic food pyramid, which is wrong for food, but we'll, we'll use it here and <laughs> just to sort of demonstrate how uh, insufficient or inadequate the official ways of learning or understanding history really are. So at the base of your kind of food pyramid, there is the fact that humans have consciousness at all, which violates materialism. So they're wrong out of the gate at this point. And then you kind of move up to the next level on this consciousness food pyramid where you have the very common psi effects like telephone telepathy and so on and then you move up to the next level and you got a couple of them there's things like remote viewing and um divination and, and whatever and then at the very kind of pinnacle you have contact consciousness contact with um more than or other than human entities and this is the kind of thing that we have a bunch of evidence for, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That we kind of need to, we need a model or a science of mind that looks vaguely like that when we want to start exploring these realms. Now, once you kind of have that in place, you look back through history at, at the sort of quote unquote ancient aliens bait moments. And and one of them is Nabta Playa, which is in um, Western Egypt, for people who don't know this, um, Dr. Thomas Brophy, who I, from memory is ex-NASA, and Robert Boval have written a couple of books about this. Uh, and essentially it is a, this is at the time 10, 12,000 years ago, where you have um, nomadic herds people. So they're sort of moving around with the cattle. This is before, allegedly before settled Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this, this star map that is a sort of Orion um also with some serious, it's, it's actually quite a complex um, collection of still very small, only a couple of feet high um, stone structures. And then underneath it, because it's in this, what's now a dried up, um, I was going to say billabong, but let's just say dried up small pond. So as a result, there's like a mud layer underneath the bedrock. And the bedrock itself is carved. And it's carved into this shape that according to Dr. Thomas Brophy, he was an astrophysicist, mm -hmm. this is the shape of the Milky Way galaxy. And not just that, but there are different implications of um, the spin and the speed at which uh, different parts of the galaxy are moving based on the ratio of where these different stones are in the Nabta Playa structure. Now, if your whole life is following herds in West Africa of cattle. You don't need to know the velocity that the universe is expanding at. This is not information that is useful to you. So when you look across the timeline for these moments of what I think are contact or these sort of contact events, the key point is to look for redundant information in the signal. And that's a very good one. The other one that we spoke about um, is the Dogon, where not only do they get – they don't actually well, need to know the, the relative mass of the stars, right? And Gordon, they also, we're, uh, we're at the bottom of the hour. I want to continue on the Dogon. Let's, let's take a very quick break here, and we will come back to that. And I definitely want to talk about Gobekli Tepe as well, but we've got time for all of that. I'm Richard Dolan here with the brilliant Gordon White, author of Star.Ships, A Prehistory of the Spirits. Fascinating. We'll be right back on KGRA Radio. We're back. I'm here with Gordon White, author of Star.Ships. Is it just Starships or am I yeah, wrong? Star ships. Star yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a little dot in the middle, so I just wanted to get yeah, that right. Yeah, which we're like <laughs> – it's my my publishers are brilliant uh, as you see the book is a remarkable artifact um, which i can take no credit for but where they're, they're kind of playing with um because it's about navigation and, and human migra migration and all that so it's about the stars but it's also about ships and and how we kind of colonize ah. the planet and uh, so it's got layers because we're terribly clever um, so we were talking a little bit about you were just getting into the dogon uh before the last break and Lots of people have heard about the Dogon. Some people know about the Dogon. What 
what were you about to say about them? They're absolutely fascinating, and uh, I know you've got them in this book. Well, so obviously this is the the story of um, the pale fox and some early to mid 20th century French anthropological research in Africa amongst the Dogon. And uh, it's one of those things that just kind of sticks out as being odd because they came back with, oh, well, um, Sirius is not just a, a, a twin star system, which is difficult to tell with, uh, well, it's impossible to tell with the naked eye, but also that there's a third smaller one, which actually has the, like, it's in fact the heaviest. Well, well perhaps so, we may want to back up because I don't know if everyone knows the uh, complete story of why the Dogon are important. And I'll, I'll just start by saying they were, uh, they are a tribe in Mali, I believe in Western Africa, mm-hmm. uh, that were very remote, um, for a very, very long time, were studied by, I know, Mercier Eliot. I have one of his, his old books. French um, anthropologists studied them in the, what, 1940s, 1950s, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, I think there were others as well, but essentially they came back with the this uh, cosmology that the Dogons related to them about their uh, civilization coming from beings who arrived from a particular star, and the star was uh, Sirius, B, they said mm-hmm. that there's an invisible star around that star Sirius, and at the time, of course, no one knew that there was a Sirius B. Uh, they said this is an invisible star, and they had other things to say about it, which uh, when were discovered in the 1970s uh, caused a bit of a stir about the Dogon. So the question was, did they get this information via the ancient aliens route, or was it just a lucky guess, or were they polluted by by the modern Europeans coming in and somehow giving them ideas that they shouldn't have had, that type of thing. Yeah, the the common dismissal is that somehow Giraud in particular um, infected them with the mid-20th century understanding of um, Sirius as a sort of twin star system. But the thing is, they didn't. They got the masses correct as well. And also, um, mm-hmm. as we mentioned before, like he is one of the grandfathers of French anthropology. Like everything else he does can't be touched, but somehow he got this wrong, um, which is surprising. <laughs> but the other, the other That's part a good of point. it that I, yes. it's a very good example of that redundant information that that I was talking about. Because again, the the kind of story that the Dogon have of these beings. Um, teaching them various things. And this is important for the Starship's thesis. They're kind of aquatic. They're they're sort of half fish beings. Uh, And they're associated with Sirius. That's where they live. That's what happens. And this is the story he comes back with. Now, if that was simply a case of, uh, you know, in cross-contamination in an anthropological environment, then as Robert Temple, who wrote The Serious Mystery mm-hmm. uh, in the 70s, uh, and also updated it in the 90s, which is the better version, because it has a very long introduction where he mentions how the CIA stole his only copy of The Pale Fox in the 1970s from London, which is where he was living at the time. Now, why would they do that? Uh, the Pale Fox, by the way, is the is the document that describes the um, French anthropological uh, encounter with the Dogon. So the first uh-huh. information of the, the Dogon and Sirius and so on. So if that's a case of cross-contamination, it seems a, a bit too much work for the CIA to jump the pond and steal, <laughs> and steal his only copy. His one manuscript, of book. yes. Yeah, you go, well, that's interesting. Um, so there are all these extra pieces that make you realize there is something else going on there. But crucially, it's the redundant complexity in the information that I find very compelling because it's not just the accurate and pointless astronomical data that for a West African tribe. It's also that when you look at the depictions that the um, that they have of these beings, they look like, and, and other researchers have pointed it out, they look like the inside of cells and they look like they're getting information about cells and mitochondrial splitting and all that kind of stuff, which again, there's no use for that information, but presumably a complex entity or collection of entities um, living near Sirius would be privy to it. So that's the, the Starship's thesis is kind of looking for the stuff that is, it's almost like out of place intellectual artifacts that yeah, yeah. show that L- something other than um, humans are involved in this. Let's pause here because this is really worth unpacking even more. I think you're you're hitting on it, but... So, right, why would actual, let's say, actual astronauts from elsewhere come speak to the Dogon, give them all of this information, which, as you just said, is pointless. I mean, there's no need for the Dogon to have this type of level of detail. But 
when you talk about redundancies, so this is redundant information for them, but as you point out uh, at various places in your in your research, in your book, redundancies are precisely what uh, people will get through psi phenomena, through psych- psychically. Absolutely, and in yeah. particular channeling. So um, you, if you try to remote view or channel, you will get a whole bunch of information, maybe 40% of which is what you're after, and the rest of it, a lot of it will some will eventually bear out. It's like, well, I saw this kid with a purple balloon and he was doing this thing by a park and it makes no sense and then or, like it subsequently does mm-hmm. you know these things get weird and mysterious so for me and this is where the magical background i think helps when analyzing this information i look at this stuff and i see i mean this isn't this is a simplistic description but useful enough like i look and i see a, a channeling session like i, I see accurate and useful information and accurate and not useful information and that is uh that's channeling or remote viewing to me yeah it's i've i have to say i've never maybe i just haven't gotten out enough but i have not encountered this thesis before and i don't think i have either <laughs> yeah so is this your i mean i just want to ask you is this your original thesis as far as you can tell is anyone else as far as i can this? tell yes i I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on that because i would love to talk to someone <laughs> Who's also doing right. it? But, it's uh, it's very interesting, yes. and honestly, uh, I mean, I don't know how one can prove or disprove this, but at least initially. But I will just say um, it has more logic to it than a lot of the other explanations that uh, we hear about. You know, in terms of ancient contact with other other types of beings and so forth. So I. I, I found it it very has the benefit of, of parsimony because we don't yes. have to make that great cosmic leap because we know that humans can do these things. So it may be right. You know right. what? Some beings <clears throat> may have actually come from Sirius to talk to the Dogon, but we don't need that to open the door to having these discussions and research about what humans are and what else might be out there and and how we have a relationship with the wider universe and where we get our ideas and complexity and technology from. Like, we actually don't need the spaceships to have an ancient aliens discussion. Well, we, you realize this opens up an entire whole <clears throat> world of objections that so many people will be having and do have with this type of thesis, which is that, oh, here we go, more woo, more consciousness, more unprovable claims about uh, having telepathic connection with uh, you know, other beings and so on. And I simply think of my own journey in this field, which has now been about 25 years and how where I've gone in terms of where I was at when I started and, and what I look at now. And, um, it's very easy for me to understand and sympathize with the standard classical materialist conception of wanting clear-cut, answers that can be weighed and measured and um, written down accurately into a book and said, Here, this is the truth. But in reality, the I, I think things are um, not going to be so simple and could very well be much more complex. And I think you're, you're kind of moving into that, into that territory. Yeah. The, the kind of, we were, on my show last week, we were talking about um, updating the ETH. I, I can't help classic mid 20th century ETHs if they, uh, if they think materialism is still valid, like I, I, I can't help you until until you've done that work for yourself because it is it's been falsified thrice, like very impressively, and can't even describe material correctly. So, if people are out there and are looking for, I think the best encapsulation that's come out in the last few years of where psi research and its implications are, Dr. Dean Radin's latest book called Real Magic um, mm-hmm. is absolutely the place to start because he pulls together the the sort of more than a century of this kind of stuff to go, well, look, we actually have loads of data <laughs> mm-hmm. that shows that this stuff is real. So it's, 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 I find it the kind of hilarious loop, which is that classic pushback of, oh, more woo woo. And you go, I think you'll find I'm the one with the data and you're the one with the baseless premise or belief system that has in fact been falsified. And it's this kind of curious reversal where people think they're being pragmatic by being materialist, but it's the yeah. opposite. It's it's like provably wrong. So like I'm probably 99% wrong because that's just how these things go, right? But I'm not 100% wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and that's all you need. <laughs> I want I want to read the, the latest book by Dean Radin. I have Entangled Minds, which is a much older book. Uh, still a really good one for me. Anyway, it was a very useful book. But uh, yes, I want to I get that new one. 
Um, so back to, so we, we covered the Dogon a little bit, and um, you may have more to say about that. I hope we can jump into Gobekli Tepe. Uh, do you want to, do you want to get into that right now? Can we? Sure, I'd love to. Yeah. And so for anyone who doesn't know, Gobekli Tepe, actually you described this so beautifully, but I think you said it was like the most important archaeological discovery of all time, of all time, mm. I think is what you said. But for those who haven't known, it's only been um, uh, known about for the past 25 years, mid-1990s. You're going to give more detail on this, but I just want to say it's incredibly old. It's old enough to blow out our previous chronologies of what people had assumed or scholars had assumed human civilization was. In other words, Gobekli Tepe is a series of stone structures that seem to me far too old to make sense because they predate agriculture as far as we can tell. And I I have not been able to understand that myself, but why don't you take it from here, Gordon, and just describe for in, for people what this is all about. Why is Gobekli Tepe significant? Gobekli Tepe, I think it is because of the the philosophical implications of how we used to live in our relationship to the wider universe and, and whatever, however you want to describe these off-world or whatever beings, right? Uh, it is essentially the Tutankhamun tomb for the Paleolithic. It is a astonishing and just astoundingly rare discovery. And the reason, because it's it's the earliest that we've found that has been dug up is 10,000 BC. So it's 12,000 years old. However, only about nine and a half hectares of the site have been excavated. And there's probably around 30 hectares in total. So we're not anywhere near the end of this. And what's important about that is this sort of artificial hill, the, the Tepe part in Gobekli Tepe um, is, well, it's artificial. So they appear to have been building on top of it, which means uh, once you get down to the bottom, which we have not, um, who knows how old um, that's mm-hmm. going to get at this point. But even at even at 12,000 years ago, uh, that, that blows out all the doors on how we thought uh, humans would work. And now what you essentially have is these astonishing collections, well, these astonishing circular-ish enclosures um, of carved T-pillars. And crucially, they are um, they're relief carved. We would discuss this in the desert as well, which means they, yes. they, they don't have their imagery carved into it. They've had the entire big chunks of stone carved out around the crocodiles and the cranes and all, and, the, and by the way, crocodiles in... Uh, Eastern Turkey, surprising, but um, all these different animals and beings and and scorpions and spiders and so on that are carved in, generally speaking, we'll just use enclosure D as the example, in a sort of approximate circle. And in the middle are two larger T-shaped pillars um, that Dr. Klaus Schmidt, who discovered Gobekli Tepe, uh describes as heavenly beings he actually describes these he's dead now but he described these enclosures as a gathering of heavenly beings because these enormous tea pillars in the middle mm. are sitting very 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 gently on they're not dug into the ground they're sort of sitting on little slots each the upshot of that is that when you slap them they hum so this wow this wow. temple is not just associated with the stars, which we'll get to in a second, but it is a it is a ritual and performance area that has something to do with the combination of stone and sound, which we of course then find through Sumer and Egypt. But here, whatever was going on involved um, drugs, probably. This is Dr. Schmidt. If you look at the kind of areas that are currently being called food preparation, but they weren't because no one lived there. Uh, he says this could have been used for drugs, and it, it's likely that it would have been an einkorn wheat beer that was um, that had maybe a fly agaric mushroom or, or something in it. But there, it was clearly a space where people would um, go and eat nothing but meat. It's a hunter's temple. Uh, get a little bit high, dance, drum, what have you, and it, all of this has something to do with beings from the sky. Um, because it's astronomically aligned and there's something curious about the choice of animals, which I think are totems for the different groups that would actually come yes. and participate in the building and, and the, the ceremonies. Um, but there's something curious about the fact that you have about half the classical astrological houses depicted. So there's a sort of, you can squint at that and go, hmm, all right, well, there's definitely a scorpion and that bird could be a, another, you know, asterism and so on. So there's some kind of weird combination of 
tribal totem animal, for want of a less problematic term, and its association with the stars and the fact that these two pillars essentially point at Orion, which is mm -hmm. what well, they do point at Orion, which is the um, hunter. And what I think is interesting about that is at about 10,000 BC, because there are two in the middle, right? And they point at Orion. At about 10,000 BC, um, this is when Sirius, in companionship with Orion, became visible again above the horizon at this point in Turkey. Uh -huh. So the hunter got its companion at around the same time we have the earliest of these temples, which is a hunter's temple with two in the middle. And that strikes me as cosmically significant. If I am a hunter-gatherer and Orion is in some way associated with... Um, Orion is a hunter. My cosmo yeah, yes, my exactly. cosmology. Like, it's a big deal when, like, your main god gets a companion. Mm -hmm. So it's just there's very, some very interesting. interesting alignments with the origins of it. But also, no one lives there. Here's the crucial thing about Gobekli Tepe and why it is so important. Well, no one lived there. Uh, there are no settlements. It's not a settlement. There's no water nearby. There wasn't um, before the end of the Ice Age, same thing. Uh, so it's not a place people lived, um, which s strongly suggests that it was a place that people would regularly gather different tribes from across the area. And we have obsidian that's come from Anatolia, and, and, and kind of has the same chemical match to stuff that's been found in Iran. And so there appears to be some sort of Paleolithic trade route. But under, consider the complexity that we're talking about here. So multiple tribes, 12,000 years ago plus, with a accurate and detailed and fascinating understanding of the night sky and our relationship to it in some sense being tutelary. So there is something about the stars that teaches mankind things like hunting and also that they can come together presumably calendrically so at mm -hmm. when the stars show up at certain points they all come together the only um food remnants that are there are wild taxa so wild animals so it's it is literally a hunter's temple they didn't they, they weren't growing anything yet any of that kind of stuff so they would get together and do this and this is way this is why it's kind of like a Rosetta Stone for the Paleolithic because it permanently breaks our idea that they were dumb, that they were hostile, that they didn't communicate, that they had no cosmology. The idea that religion emerged as a side effect of farming so that once we had – um, sufficient right. calories stored. We would sit around the fireplace, uh, sit around the fire, and make up stories. Is the materialist wrong view of where um, spirituality comes from? Well, may because I may I just ask something here? Um, it's that's one way to look at it. The the problem that I have always had in understanding Gobekli Tepe once it became clear to me just how sophisticated this structure, this uh, complex structure is, is. Um, how it was built in a pre-agricultural era before presumably there were settled communities where you would have a hierarchy and division of labor and so on. I mean, I just, and you look at the, the relief stones, by the way, your book has some very nice, uh, very well reproduced photographs of some of these. Um, and as you were saying, this is, the relief is where, you know, the stone is carved away to create the image. And so if, as I think you said in the book, one mistake and you start over. It's yep. because and you need to know what it looks like before you begin. And, and the, so, that's right. These are beautifully done. The artwork is – it's very, very nicely done. So I just keep marveling at the ability of a hunter-gatherer society to have the complexity, to have the organization, to create uh, a, a structure such as this. And the name of your chapter, by the way, which I think you took from Dr. Schmidt, says it all. The cathedral predates the city. Exactly. And that's yeah. why it's so important. So when you're, when you're saying marveling at the complexity, what's happening there is I would say uh, finish the book and, and really sit with the idea that this happened and kind of recall that time um, with the Ananu, for instance. And, and you, we associate complexity with things that look like London. Um, but the cathedral predates the city in the sense that before we lived in houses – or grew food, we built a star temple on a hill. Now, what that says that the, is that mankind has been asking the same questions forever. What's it about? Where are we from? Where do we belong in the universe? And 
these questions are of sufficient importance that we not only build Gobekli Tepe, but we let it run for thousands of years uh, until it actually falls out of alignment and it has to be kind of carefully packed away uh, and they move on to other things. But so we have at this kind of crossover point, why it's a Rosetta Stone is that the earliest layers are Paleolithic and the more recent layers are Neolithic, right? Mm -hmm. And we kind of understand the Neolithic because here we're getting people living in huts and growing food and we sort of have a model uh, or, or, or lived experience that allows us to inhabit the mind of the Neolithic. The Paleolithic, less so. But what's so crucial about Quebecli Tepe is it shows the continuity of the we can in fact extend our uh, our mind and our kind of, I don't know, thinking with uh, of of Paleolithic thought that far back because they're thinking the same things. Like you, you have this crossover of um, mankind and stars and 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 all this kind of stuff that's so important to us and is is essentially like ufology twelve thousand years ago. Like mm. this is this is that story. Yes, absolutely. And, and I just want uh, people to understand when you by Paleolithic versus Neolithic, I mean, it's essentially pre agriculture versus uh, early agriculture societies. Yes. Uh, and that transition uh, is basically uh, probably the single most important uh, material transition we can say for the human for human civilization, you know, the uh, moving from hunting, hunting and gathering to a settled agriculturally based society by all of the uh, information we have is really what created the foundations for human civilization as we have it now. But again, Gobekli Tepe just breaks all those rules. And, it does. Uh, and this, you know, is this why, I think you suggest this, if I'm not mistaken, why the academic community is, it can, really continues to sort of just push Gobekli Tepe aside. They don't know what to do with it? No, they don't. And since Dr. Schmidt died, because he was a, he was a brilliant man, um, he, the, one of the reasons Gobekli Tepe survives at all because here's the other thing about it. it it seems so unique and bizarre and beautiful and profound to us but that's because it's had to survive unmolested for 12 millennia which nothing else has and this appears to be because the little bits of it that were sticking at the top of the hill were mistaken for a medieval uh, muslim cemetery and obviously you can't disturb a muslim grave so no one ever really looked at it so it had been um People had surveyed it and decided it was a medieval Muslim cemetery in the 20th century. But uh -huh. Dr. Schmidt went and realized, oh, no, it isn't. But the point is, there could have been, there wasn't, but there could have been a Gobekli Tepe on every damn hill throughout Eurasia 12,000 years ago. It's just that the reality of archaeology is so little survives, and that's why it's so amazing. And so we have this one little peak uh, that, that proves that they had the same kind of the, the same kind of spiritual mm -hmm. seeking and and understanding and whatever that we have now, the same. But we have no evidence to suggest that uh, as to quite how widespread it was because so little survives. And it's just this weird, remarkable twist of fate that uh, this – It's an incredible thing about our past, which is that when you get past a few thousand years, it's just – all goes away. It's almost impossible to recover. We talk about archaeology and you know digging up the human past, but it is remarkable and it's startling, really, to think how nearly all of human remains are just after five hundred years they're just gone. After a thousand years, there's even more that's gone. In five thousand years, ten thousand years, there's just almost nothing there. Um, you know, I used to marvel living in London that people would be you know digging up for cross rail or whatever and they'd find stuff from the victorian era now how did you lose that that's only 120 right. years ago and you go exactly. oh look there's a victorian factory here you go, what the? we're in the middle of london how did you lose that in no, 120 exactly. years and you think twelve thousand years ago <laughs> no and in fact uh there is a site uh an ancient site um about i think um a 50 kilometers south of gobekli tepe i think you mentioned this in the book as well i didn't know about this actually and um, not as large, but there are oh, these Karahan others. Tepe, yes. yes, exactly. So, yeah, so that, that indicates that this area, which makes sense because you're kind of at the top of the um, Tigris-Euphrates catchment. So you're at the top of what will become many thousands of years later, I stress, Mesopotamia. Yeah. Right? So um, 
it's an area that you would cross through during the ice age. Um, there was lots of food, pistachio trees, plenty of water. Like it was actually, a, it was a paradise. Basically, it was a great place to live. Um, so you kind of get a sense, and this is crucial to the thesis when we move into the mythology chapters, where I rely on the work of a Harvard Indologist called Dr. Witzel, mm. that um, if you can demonstrate archaeology, because it's sort of Chinese footbound by materialism and the things that it can and can't say, mm -hmm. um, doesn't allow for you to compare next to mythology and, and genetics and so on because these we've kind of carved up the study of knowledge into these silly little boxes and i often think something like alternate historian or whatever is the wrong word when you really should be an interdisciplinary historian mm -hmm. because we we, do, we have the freedom to um derive information or inspiration or data across multiple domains in a way that you kind of can't if you're an Egyptologist or so on. And that, so Karahan Tepe is kind of very useful to evidence to show that, well, the, I can now demonstrate that the cosmology expressed at Gobekli Tepe extended beyond Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, so let's have a look at quite how far that may have extended. Well, we are at the top of the hour, Gordon. We've got uh, a full hour to go, so I want to continue this conversation with you. But right now, we're going to take a quick break. I'm Richard Dolan here with Gordon White, author of Starships on KGRA Radio. We will be right back. We're back. I'm Richard Dolan here with Gordon White. We're talking about, well, primarily his book, Starships, um, and uh, A Prehistory of the Spirits. We were just getting into uh, the the whole mystery and anomaly. Well, I don't know if it's an anomaly of Gobekli Tepe, but it sure seems like an anomaly to me in so many ways. I'd still, I, I'm going to be spending a lot of time trying to understand how and why this was built. But I recall talking with you, Gordon, two months ago when we were in the center of Australia, the navel of the world, Uluru, and uh, you had you put out this kind of idea or suggestion about Gobekli Tepe. And I actually can't remember the full imp import of it at, at this moment, but it had something to do with essentially Gobekli Tepe was a, a, a kind of a, a teaching device for us about, about the universe or about our place in the universe. Am I getting this wrong or can you it's, um, clarify that so for th me? This is where the – the background in magic really, really helps because what you have here archaeologically is the pieces of one, a really good Friday night, if that's your jam, um, but two, <laughs> um, some kind of ritual contact with extra dimensional beings. And you can decide whether they are physical or world entities. You can decide on whatever they are yourself. It's sort of irrelevant for the discussion because what you have is the use, you have a ritual space. And you have clearly the use of sound and you ritual magic when you think about it. And in fact, civic magic in Suma and the old kingdom, Egypt and all that kind of stuff is essentially an exercise in getting their attention. Now, whoever they are ah. is up for debate. So here you have the here you have the drugs and the drumming and the food offerings of wild animals that you have hunted because it is only wild taxa that's there. And you have this capacity, again, this is that kind of proto-hermetics of whatever you're doing is in some way you're getting their attention, calling them down. Uh, and in that sense, it's a teaching space because what is so fascinating about, one, that works. Um, I, and I know maybe people listening... You can form your own opinions about that, but it works. Um, what's so fascinating about Gobekli Tepe is that there are a f well, many things, but there are just these weird echoes through much, much, much later mythology and texts that indicate that probably something did go on there. And I'll, and I'll leave the kind of weird, creepy bit um, for the end of that um, later. So you have what's called the cattle and grain text or the Mulapan text in Suma. So again, you're, we have to jump... 7,000 years at this point. So effectively two whole Egypts. Like you, this is so far back, right? Yeah. So I have to jump 7,000 years from uh, Gobekli Tepe to Suma. And we have this text called the Mulapan text. And it's essentially the story of um, the Anunnaki descending on a hill and giving grain to mankind. 
And you go, that's sort of, okay, fine. That could be anything. You know, there are cosmic hills and and, and whatever. You go, all right, fine. Let's look at the sort of many versions, because there are multiple versions, most famously in the Book of Enoch, of the Shemhazai and Azazel story, or Azazel story, right? Uh-huh. So here's another version of it where you have watchers or some form of heavenly beings that descend to Earth and teach us things like metallurgy and, and agriculture and, yes. and so on. Yes. And Shemazai and Azazel, there's two of them. And in one of the stories in particular, uh, Azazel stays, but in one of the stories in particular, they they actually do descend and teach essentially drug making and um and agriculture on this hill. And what's so strange, so here we have two angelic beings in the middle of this temple on a hill. Got a couple of stories of that that are in, that are tumble down, tumble down, tumble down, tumble down versions of stories from the same approximate geographic area, right? And the kind of wider thesis in the book is that in fact, some stories can last up to 50,000 years. This is Dr. Witzel's story. We can get, to, or thesis, we can get to that in a second. Because the weird part about Gobekli Tepe and the stories of heavenly beings descending and teaching us things like agriculture and so on, right. is that all modern wheat, if you that is eaten today in the world is a genetic descendant of the einkorn wheat that is grown in the hills on, we're well not on Gobekli Tepe, but around Gobekli Tepe. So this is the origin of wheat. And in the middle of it is this hill with these two heavenly beings, like a temple to exactly. these star beings. And you go, now that, and there are just these echoes many thousands of years later, but in the same geographic area, of this very story. Now that right, I what are the your materialist answer for? The, you right, exactly. Gobekli Tepe predates settled communities, settled agriculture, but that's right. The origin of the wheat that we eat, arguably the the foundation for modern uh, modern civilization, is the cultivation of wheat. Perhaps in the, in the Near East, shortly after, well, shortly, maybe several centuries after Gobekli Tepe was established as a, as the cathedral for yeah. hunter-gatherer society. So, and I'll do you one what, better. What, the um, yeah. Shiraz grape that wine descends from is from approximately the same area as well. So very interesting. And yeah. I just wonder if there isn't a cultural memory of a contact moment um, that we see expressed in the Mulapan text I mean, and what, in the stories of Shemhazai and Azazel. What we're, what we're getting at is that Gobekli Tepe arguably could be the spark to human civilization when you really get it down would, to it. I would say it's, it's – uh, I don't like that because um, I have this kind of bugbear about we consider agriculture to be the agriculture that we are – most familiar with, but I'm a permaculture designer. And in fact, um, the New Guineans mm-hmm. and the Australian Aborigines were doing what I would describe as agriculture 40,000 years ago, right? So, um, but it is a contact point to change mankind. And this is sort of the thesis Fine. of the book yeah, is yeah. that if you look across history, yeah. we have contact events that spin us off in different directions. Well, I'm not uh, even saying that they would have created agriculture per se, but but the form of settled communities uh, based on Growing wheat yeah, and that type of agriculture that transformed just, human civilization. And it started, one could say, at Gobekli Tepe. Yes. And what's interesting, and this is where, uh, again, a magical perspective helps, is that Shemazai and Azazel, and certainly the Anunnaki, are morally ambiguous beings. They, like, they, they don't have a human morality. So w- we tend to approach these stories when you're talking about angels as being a benign influence, but consider exactly what we consider the good and the bad that came with wheat and the stratification of society and as a result yes. um, differences in gender roles and 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 the slave trade and and capitalism and diabetes and so lots of good things <laughs> happened but lots of bad things happened right, right? and that's and the double edged nature that, of the gods that's the other kind of smell or mouthfeel you get for me from a magical perspective from an authentic kind of contact event is its moral ambiguity we want it to be this nice benign story but um the more than human world is under no obligation to be nice to us neither is a shark they just exist yeah i absolutely agree with that and uh, i'm really glad we took a few minutes to talk about this element of gobekli tepe uh just fascinating 
Now, you wanted to go uh, into a, another direction that you covered in this book, and it really had to do with uh, sort of the origin of of human mythology or um, – Yeah, so what happens with yeah. what happens with something – an archaeological discovery like a Beckley Tepe is you go, right, so we've got a hunting god and the stars and, and all this kind of stuff um, at 12,000 years. It's like, well, what, who is doing research on – what mythologies look like here, and in particular things like Orion, because speaking of Australia again, 90% of all Aboriginal star lore associated with Orion is of a hunter or a hunting group. And as you and I both know, um, these cultures have been continually practicing for over 50,000 years. So I have a time depth of 50,000 to 12,000 years where Orion is still this hunter, right? Right. That's interesting. So who is doing, so now we have this big view over the Paleolithic and the Ice Age of at least one continuity. Are there others? And there is a guy, he might be retired now, he wrote this book, um, uh, Dr. Witzel. He's a Harvard Indologist, so he spent most of his career doing uh, India stuff, the Vedas and, and that kind of thing, right? And then he comes out with this book, which is deeply, it's the kind of book you can only write at the end of your career, put it that way, mm -hmm. at the end of a long career <laughs> uh -huh. where people can't really do anything to you anymore because this great doorstop of a book on the origins of the world's mythologies is this masterpiece where he says, look, I've been doing mythology for 50 years and I've essentially family treed the recurring motifs that we find around the world uh -huh. and matched it to the information we have, the genetic information we have about the population of the planet out of Africa, right? And it is the most astonishing compilation thing. This is, look, this is a first attempt because, again, this is so out of fashion because we're supposed to be – you're not supposed to have grand narratives. You're supposed to be, um, oh, well, what about this context and, you know – It's all postmodern now. It's all postmodern. Correct, correct. Yes, exactly. Um, and, Get into the details. The Don't look at the big picture. The, every yeah. every culture is unique and has, must be identified on its own terms, not in relation to anything else. And, and the trouble fractures. with that, of course, it, well, it is that nothing arms. else. Yeah. yeah, nothing else is. So we actually genetically yeah. know that, um, at least in terms of North America, the the First Nations people are genetically related to the say. Well, the kind of I don't want to say shamanic. It's challenging, but there's shamanish cultures that you find in Northern Eurasia. Yes, like this is a genetic fact. So you can, and it doesn't mean you don't appropriate or say you invented or you, there, there is a polite way of doing this, but it's work that needs doing. And anyway, Dr. Witzel is this, this big, messy book and he admits it's messy because he's like, I'm just like this one guy trying to compile and some of this will be wrong, but we should be looking in this direction. And it's that kind of really noble academia that I like, which yes. is I'm just going to put this out there. Here is, I'm tabling this. Let's just have a bash at it. And he's essentially found and this is curious because it matches the genetic population of the Earth. He's essentially split the belief systems or the religion of planet Earth into sort of layers. Uh, and at about 40,000 years ago, he describes the Laurasian layer um, emerging out of an earlier layer called Gondwana, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't relate geologically because Gondwana is actually only 65,000 years ago rather than a few billion. But the Laurasian motifs are world egg, the separation of father, heaven, mother, earth, descending generations of divine children, uh, and, a, and a trickster slash demiurge who brings civilization, killing of the dragon, flood, and a golden age that is, we've descended from, so an so, Atlantis story. Hold on right there. Apocalypse. I want to make sure I'm following you. So the Laurasian motifs were roughly 40,000 years ago. And what he's identifying is that these were the dominant types of uh, religious beliefs that were around at that time. Is that so the thesis, right? the thesis, um, the, Laurasia, the Laurasian story is defined as a novel. It has a beginning, it has a creation of the universe and it has an apocalypse. And in between the sort of creation and the end, you have separation of, Father Heaven, Mother Earth, and the descending generation, the divine children, and a killing of the dragon, and all these things. So basically, everything you find in the Old Testament mm -hmm. is, and, and Egypt, and uh, the Maya, and everywhere else is 40,000 years ago, because it has to be, because that's the last time they were all in the one spot. This is so crucial when we're kind of jailbreaking the ancient aliens. Ah, uh, okay, so this is right. I'm going to stop you again. Because, i got to stop you again. So... This is kind of like uh, when linguists do an analysis of the origin of a language, that. right? So you yes, go back and you, that. yeah. So like um, 
the uh, the number three is related to the I think the Hindu number T, and so you go back to Indo-European, you find that there was a common language at a certain period of time. You're doing the same thing with he's doing the same thing with with the religion and mythology. So you're finding yes. common motifs from the Maya, from other groups and around the world, and he traces them back to forty thousand years ago. And, For, well, this is the last time they're all in the one spot to be able to share that part of the belief yeah, system. So and obviously, you, they mutate over millennia as people so, move about the earth. You just have to forgive me for uh, plodding along here a little bit more slowly than the way you're able to explain it. And uh, so I thank you for your patience. But I think no, I'm following you here. It's, it's a, and why I thought it was so useful to put in this book is that this is an essential component of if we are going to find the proverbial flying saucers in the history books, yeah. what we need to stop doing is playing bingo up and down the timeline, going, oh, there's a pyramid there, there's a pyramid there, separated by 4,000 years of history, and, and just kind of like going, oh, look, they had a guy that had a thing with a snake head, and so did that one, and that must be aliens. You go, God damn, <laughs> can you actually just, let's just have a mature and updated understanding of humans and mythology and then look for the flying saucers because you guys are digging in the wrong place Indy. Like, no, I, this com- an- I could not agree more i could not agree more with <laughs> and this. so and i don't believe dr witzel set out to save um ancient aliens theory in fact i'm quietly certain he didn't but right. nevertheless he has <laughs> yeah. because um when you match the motifs of thousands and thousands of different myths around the world and for instance one of them because it goes back so Laurasia emerged 40,000 years ago from the earlier belief system, which he calls Gondwana. Gondwana uh-huh. um, is probably the cosmology or collection of stories we took with us out of Africa. And you find it most potently and continuously expressed now in Aboriginal Australia and New Guinea. And rather than having a beginning and end to the universe, which we like as a novel, right? Yes. Which is the Bible and the Hindu epics and everything else. You have a sense of continuous creation. You have a totemic origin for mankind. So um, typically a tree, but like if you consider the, the totems that we sort of saw in the, oh, right. Tepe and the so world you tree do, type you of do event. have a creator God, yeah. but it's a distant one and, and it doesn't care about you and you can't possibly conceive about it. And there is still, and this is important, there is still a civilizing trickster that is very often a snake, um, but comes down from the stars and teaches mankind hunting and taboos and so on. So as he's moved up to the 65,000 point, we still have a civilizing trickster coming down from the stars. Right. That's as far as you can go archaeologically, because you, you, then you tend the same thing with a family tree or, or linguistics. You kind of run out of words to compare, to look for mutations at 65,000 years. So what he does at this point is he makes one up in a good sense, in a good and informed sense. And he says, here is what I think the original belief system for mankind is based on me family treeing the entire planet's mythology up. And he called it pan And he says, we probably mm-hmm. got this 150,000 to 65,000 years ago. And the pan belief, as far as he can tell, um, and this is sort of like using frog DNA to bring dinosaurs back to life. Like this is Witzel. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Right, this right. is Witzel's frog DNA, yeah. and he admits that, but we'll just go with it. So you, you have a high god departing Earth for a pre-existing heaven. Same. Th- so you have creation is irrelevant to Gondwana cultures because creation is continuous. So there's, there might be, a, there is probably a god. It doesn't care about us. We don't care about it. It sends down a trickster emissary. Mankind violates some form of taboo or there is a fall, and this is either related to the trickster emissary or the trickster vanishes after that. And there is a well of souls and a giant snake. Now, the well of souls one is interesting. Well of souls. So wow. you know the kind of nursery rhyme or nursery idea that babies are carried by the stork from, like, to the mother, mm-hmm. right? Yes. This is found... This is a West. No, this is a sub-Saharan African belief that a stork will carry a soul from the well of souls to the mother, and so it's. This is a seventy thousand year old uh, motif that's found around the world, but it's most we know it from European nursery rhymes. And and so what Dr. Witzel has is this idea of grandmother stories and grandfather stories. And grandfather stories are the official ones, and they change with the politics. So we move from 
settlement to poly to state polytheism to state monotheism to whatever we are now. The grandmother stories are the ones that have no political impact and they're the ones that are told to the children by grandmothers and so on. And it's, it's in the grandmother lineage, something like the Well of Souls and whatever survives. And that one, it was always stuck with me because you think you learned that as a kid, you might've even told your kids that you are recounting a story that mankind has been telling itself for 70,000 years at least. And this is the kind of work that needs doing to, in conjunction with the sort of Psy stuff we open the show with. So you right. put these two things together or hold them next to each other and then you look for the flying saucers. I, I had some. I, there at, are some. At some yes. point, I would like to know, um, not for this program, but how how he was able to come up with this uh, genealogy, as it were, of our belief systems. But we'll have to dig into his work and, and probably your book to get that whole story unpacked. Right now, I'm just going to take it as a given, and I find it fascinating. And I'm sure his work is um, very well thought out. Um, so that's the thing about the mythology, and and why then does this connect with? Um, well, actually, there's a couple of things I'm asking. So how does this connect with, I guess, uh, the UFO or al- ancient aliens phenomenon? But I definitely want not. I don't want to lose sight of the trickster god concept. Well, that's it how it connects, me, Richard. Yeah. Ah, there we are. The trickster. Yes, indeed. Yes. So we have a we have a civilizing trickster coming down from the stars, teaching us things, and not only do we have that. We have a memory of that that goes back as far as Dr. Witzel can tell 150,000 years ago. So remember when I said I was an interventionist? Right, yes. <laughs> um, I am. And, and, and I it's, think it's and this, the is, this is how you do ancient aliens. Well, the trickster is how we describe it. Mm-hmm. Like it, describing the trickster is uh, n- not necessarily impossible, but something of a fool's errand. Mm-hmm. So what's contained within the trickster is all kinds of bizarre phenomena, right? Like Mothman and, and, and all the rest of it. That's what's contained in this um, archetype of this form. So when you're looking at a time depth of 150,000 years, um, all we have is the memory of, of an event that something came and taught us some things or gave us some skills. And again, moral ambiguity, no idea why. Uh, and that's that's ancient aliens. That's doing ancient aliens right, as far as I can tell. I don't know what, and I think the trickster stories are a memory of a very important contact event. And it's just so fascinating that as you move back through Witzel's family tree, and all the other stuff starts to drop away, all the other stuff starts to drop away, and then you get to 150,000 years, and uh, it is basically the story of a trickster emissary coming down and teaching us things. You know, it's almost hard for me to respond right now because my mind is reeling. And I realize I'm doing a show with you, so I have to talk. But um, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm almost laughing. I'm thinking of a title to put for this on when this goes on YouTube. And it'll be something like uh, Gordon White, Gobekli Tepe, Ancient Aliens, and the Trickster God. And people nice. will just throw up their hands and they'll go, oh, my God, here we go. Ancient Aliens, and Gobekli Tepe. <laughs> but, but actually, the way that you're doing this uh, is so much more satisfying to me. And I um, oh, see. So you're getting the yeah. temptation of the weird title thing as well. That's why I called it Starships of Prehistory of the Spirits. So people, <laughs> yeah. no, it, it, the title is bound to disappoint everyone. <laughs> yeah, really. Honestly, the title, the main title, doesn't really get into uh, the meat of this book. But yeah, but it's about a trickster. You've got to be hiding in it. Well, so, what uh, I what I'm seeing about your book, and again, I've I've I, I've only read about 50 pages of it, but A, I, people need to know your, the writing is beautiful, and I don't say this lightly. It's absolutely wonderful writing. Um, but it's also, um, it's not the kind of book I feel that someone can just go into and say, okay, where's the information? And, you know, like a lot of times I'll treat a book like a, a soldier pillaging through a town and just, you know, looking for information, just pulling it out and then throwing it away and I'm done. Uh, your book is definitely not like that. I think of... Uh, books like yours as um, as I think of a, a, a genuine work of art or a um, uh, the way that you would approach uh, a, a profound philosophy, which is you don't go in just saying, what do you have to teach me? You go in, you know, letting the discipline teach you in its way. And then your book does that in my view. So the way that you write, the way that you tell your story, uh, a reader – needs to be able to work with you and and it's easy sentence by sentence because it's just so it's so lovely to go through the book but a reader 
I think really needs to uh, to slow down and be thoughtful because this is a book that I, I don't want to race through. I don't think it would be wise to race through this book. And that is because the ideas that you have in here are really worth uh, pondering, slowing down, uh, and really rolling over multiple times so that we absorb them. So um, it's good that we're able to talk about this here because I think it's it's probably an easier introduction uh, yeah. just so people can well, just it's listen. Very nice, yeah, very nice of you to say. I mean, yeah. you're kind of talking about the limits of the empirical model there, It's um, which I'm, I'm very interested in. If, if this information could be bullet pointed, it would have been. Um, and and we're, that that goes with so much about the phenomena that you talk about on the show. Like, um, if, if it was empirical, it wouldn't be. And I don't like these terms, but it wouldn't be more than human or extra-dimensional or supernatural or whatever you want to call it. If if it fit into the seventeenth, eighteenth century premise that the only things that exist are that that can be, you know tallied up mm -hmm. then it would have been solved by now but the very point is that it, it doesn't and you kind of have to do i love empiricism but i i love it because i know how small it actually is in terms of ways of truth validation that is available to mankind so at that point you kind of barrel roll into comparativism and you look around the world at all other cultures and and how they um whether we can learn from them, how they conceptualize their interaction with things like star beings and, and so on. And that's kind of, if if the book, believe me, I mean, because it's a large book, um, if it could have been smaller, I would have made it smaller. Yeah. <laughs> well, in a sense, uh, this is related perhaps to what you said at one point in the book that I did read, which is about uh, the need to recontextualize the uh, these ancient stories. In other words, um, my my goal always when I read books like like yours or any book uh, dealing with whether it's ancient aliens or UFOs is I want to know what is the information I want to know what is true what was the world like at this particular time and particular place and I I think that what you might be saying is something like well no that's not exactly how we're going to go about it in this case we're going to recontextualize these ancient stories and. Uh, maybe when we come back after the uh, break, because we're at the bottom of the hour here, you can explain what you mean by that. And um, and I would also like to continue a little bit more with an exploration of the trickster god concept, since this really is where I think the ancient belief systems intersect, at least as far as you're seeing it, with the ancient aliens concept. So how about that when we come back, Gordon? Sounds great. All right. I'm Richard Dolan here with Gordon White. We're talking about his research, his book, Star Ships, A Prehistory of the Spirits, here on KGRA Radio. Be right back. Welcome back on KGRA Radio. I'm Richard Dolan here with Gordon White, author of Star Ships. So, Gordon, uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, the trickster gods and uh, the connection that they have, A, with from our earliest, earliest pre-pre-prehistory in terms of uh, the belief systems that people had we're talking 100,000 years ago, perhaps, uh, or maybe 70,000 years ago. And um, maybe how that would connect with the UFO phenomenon today, I think that would be an interesting thing, and how it might connect with the ancient aliens phenomenon. And what, what, more, what more can we learn about the trickster god uh, from your point of view? Well, I guess listeners to the show would be familiar with the miracle at Fatima. Was it in 1916? I mean, this is one of Jacques Vallée's favorites. He calls it, you know, the technology of the BVM, right? Because if you look at it, this sort of the sun moving around and, and raining rose petals and, and giving weird prophecies about bringing Russia back to the Mother Church and all this kind of stuff is not very um, Mary, Mother of Jesus, right? Right, right. So it's, it is my absolute favorite non-Australian UFO case because that's what it is, right? <laughs> That is a, a tremendously useful because it's my favorite non-Australian UFO case. That's my. It's tremendously useful in as, as a piece of evidence for how UFO phenomena, whatever they are, get tangled up in mythology or or, or belief mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's why I start with that when we want to go talk about the trickster. Uh, origins of, of civilization and then the fact that 
globally we have this story as a result a very ancient story of something coming down from the sky and teaching us how to do things fatima is a good thing to hold in your mind when you are looking at trickster stories around the world now why do you because, why do you say that yeah, i'm curious because we don't actually know what it is we only have the cultural memory of the contact event right mm -hmm. and so these sort of hundred thousand portuguese people all catholics watching this thing are having a very high strange ufo experience within this kind of catholic frame obviously yes. so when we go back when we're looking at uh when because the word is overused, particularly in kind of magic and, and Fortean studies. The word trickster is kind of overused, uh, but it is a really useful category term for uh, for stuff like that. And, and Fatima is useful when you're looking at stories of, um, yeah, these teaching beings coming down from the stars. To so just remember that whatever that contact event was, it's being interpreted and passed through a particular spiritual frame. Uh, and that is the kind of you kind of have to look behind in an almost semiotic way to go, well, there was, I believe, I assert that there was a contact event. Um, that experience with the people involved looks like this. Uh, and, and you kind of have to uh, do it that way because this is, especially when you're following, you know, mankind's belief systems all mm. the way back into Africa and, and to, to whether we have a memory, which I think we do. I think everyone knows a couple of things intuitively about, being human, which is, we kind of, like Graham Hancock, who we mentioned earlier, says mm -hmm. we're a species with amnesia. I actually think we're a species with a hangover. I actually think, like, the most accurate movie uh, to describe the kind of Gnostic state of mankind is Dude, Where's My Car? Because <laughs> you kind of, you know that you knew it. You just feel that, you like, we used to know this stuff. But you also kind of have the intimation that the the actual story is going to be weird as balls, <laughs> right? It's going to be so weird. And that's kind of why Dude, Where's My Car, which is a terrible film, is a good example of it. You get these kind of flashes of they're at a strip club with um, dwarves and, you know, and there's something about that that I think has stuck with mankind. I think 150,000 well, years ago, we still had that same experience. Like, we used to know this. Let me, let me uh, uh, put it to you this way. It's weird. I, I, you got me thinking about this and, and uh, the Fatima event, which was a century ago now in Portugal. And it is true, like thinking of it from the point of view of this other intelligence, like let's just put ourselves in their position for a minute. So they make an appearance knowing, right? I mean, they absolutely know that their appearance is going to be interpreted in a certain way. And they know it's it's not going to be interpreted fully accurately because it's just not possible for human beings accurately to interpret really almost anything about them uh, aside from them landing on, on the ground and speaking the native language and trying to, their best to explain the world, which has never, that has not happened. So in, in other words, any kind of appearance that we have of this phenomenon, you could say is going to be uh, one in which we're interpreting in our own particular, uh, with our own cultural language, our own psychological language, and so on, in the only way that we can, and, and it will never be fully accurate. And in that sense, uh, maybe that's what, you know, the trickster phenomenon sort of implies. Exactly. Yeah. So um, a, a friend of mine, he's been on my show a couple of times, Dr. Jeff Kripal, um, quoting William James, says, we are like cats in the library. So it's not even gonna be, we're never gonna be not fully accurate, I'd be surprised if we're accurate at all. We just mm -hmm. have an awareness that cats in the library is perfect for, yeah. for, for human interaction with the more than human world. Yeah, like we'll just never get it. Uh, no, my, probably my, not. <laughs> my good friend, uh, Mike Cleland, uh, I publish a couple of Mike's books. Uh, he had the best, <laughs> one of the funniest descriptions that I've uh, encountered yet. He says, imagine like we're dogs and we um, we watch our our." people leave the house every morning, pull out of the driveway and go to work. And we get together and have conferences to discuss what is it that people are doing when they leave the driveway? <laughs> that's like, he said, that's us trying to understand this other phenomenon. We're like, we'll never be able to understand that in his yeah. opinion, I think. And, and that's a really good one because we kind of discussed on my show, um, Richard, that I actually think the high incidence of 
experience or, or contact events. I think the fact that, you know, a, a decent chunk of the population of the planet, as far as we can tell, has memories of these experiences, mm. suggests to me that it is part of the natural functioning of, I guess, our corner of the universe. Like, so the, the, the kind of macro thesis of starships is that mankind, which I believe is true, obviously, exists in a... Um, ongoing state of interaction of various levels of clarity and fidelity with the kind of extra dimensional or more than human world and i think that's the story but i think a lot of our ideas come from that we can't even get ideas right like this is a classic jungian thing right and uh -huh. he was told during his active imagination that um the ideas in his head don't belong to him like they pre-exist <laughs> it's you know um people don't have ideas ideas have people so if you're kind of realizing that <laughs> then all of a sudden you're in um you're in a, a world of kind of continuous interactivity with the more than human. And there's just been a few moments in history, which I kind of describe some of them in the book, where that has been dialed up to 11 and something really weird tips out of it. So mm -hmm. that redundant complexity and so on. And that's the kind of baseline theory of the book. And once you get that and, and, and the mythology down, then, then you genuinely can look for actual flying saucers because I do think um, there's a couple of points in the history of, the earth where you can make some very good cases and, and i mean ancient cases modern cases i'm sold on as you know mm -hmm. um ancient cases that that could have happened yeah i mean for the longest time and, and even still now predominantly my number one interest in when i look at ancient cases of uh, what we might think of ufos or uh would be examples of uh craft that would appear to be technological in one way or another and uh, that's simply a kind of a conceit, or it's a uh, you know part of my cultural uh, baggage, if you will. But I've, I'm definitely interested in looking into these types of examples. Uh, you know, what types of technology, if any, would be evidence of beings or people who are not from here, who are visiting from another system of uh, planets or stars and, and what have you. And um, so that's the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And you know, as we discussed on your your. Uh, program recently, I still think that that's a uh, a powerful argument uh, for the UFO I, phenomenon. I, I think you are a crazy person if you don't think the planet has been visited at least. Like it makes no sense to me. What world are you living in if you don't think that's happened at least once? So absolutely right, right, right. And in, and in, and in terms of for, for me, obviously coming at it from the magical background, I am genuinely kind of almost like fracking world history and mythology to look for the magic to have it to sort of emerge out and that's that's my um, focus in the same way and interest in the same yeah, way yeah. Is, is is looking for the craft i mean the the fact remains the the best example the best or a equally credible i guess is the right word for that uh interpretation of vimana in particular is actual spaceships like there's there's no other word uh, if you say that and you assert that that's completely fine so there are as i said moments in the history of the planet where you can go well that probably was a kind of richard dolan-esque visitation right there wow i get my own ad adjective i'm richard dolan-esque yeah. I, I like that very much um well yeah so but the, what i'm what i'm getting out of with your thesis is actually something really really fascinating to me at this time which is this idea that uh, the ancient aliens hypothesis doesn't really need to involve physical aliens landing on planet earth interacting with the natives and teaching them in the kind of physical material manner that we've been talking about whether it's von daniken or the the thesis of the show Ancient Aliens or, um, you know, anyone else. So I, I'm actually really, really fond of this idea of yours. Um, and uh, I want to explore more of this, these, uh, you know, the, the ancient calendars, for example, that will show certain galactic alignments, or at least appear to, uh, and other forms of evidence, the Dogons. Uh, this this uh, thesis of, I guess, of yours, of the redundancy of information that, um, you know, ancient people have and information that they simply don't need that's not relevant to their lives. Why and how would they, who would give this to them? It really doesn't make sense that you've got uh, 
you know, aliens from another planet saying, here, this is our planet, you, our star system, you can't see it, but it's up there. Like, that makes no sense whatsoever. But it does make sense in terms of using psi ability to uh, gather some of this information, which in turn makes it very, very uncomfortable for classical ufologists um, who want to deal with a different type of information. And it makes it very difficult um, for uh, materialist scientists who absolutely are going to have a very difficult time uh, accepting this type of information. And so it just makes me wonder uh, where, <laughs> how, how are we going to be able to get a society to start thinking about this in a different way? I mean, I can see that your background is, uh, as a magician, has actually helped you to have a different perspective. But I just, I really wonder... Um, how but it, it also it it also helps in the sense that I don't care. Like I, I'm already I'm already in a minority position. Like the, the idea that um, it yeah, would be lovely right. if we can get <laughs> you know the world on board with a, a sort of non-materialism because you will find that our morality will quickly change and there'll be fewer wars and and all the rest of it. That will be great. But um, I don't think again looking back through history, there haven't been too many moments, if any, where. Um, Everyone was kind of mutually agreed. Uh, everyone mutually agreed on what's going on, and it was a benign belief system. Yeah, exactly, that actually, is exactly. the best match. Funnily enough, Australian Aborigines are probably as far back as you have to go before you find a kind of way of being in the world that um, doesn't ruin everything and includes the stars and and all the rest of it. So yes, it would it would be a pity. But by the same token, mm. um, one of the, I mean, we, we this is another thing that we chatted about in the desert, but. However bad, and it is bad, the fact that the internet, rather than being a source of freedom, appears to be, uh, you know, a military intelligence surveillance platform, right? Mm. If you go into it knowing that, and you can, in fact, use it to find the others and, and share the information, you actually don't need permission from uh, – you, materialists are wrong. You don't need permission from these. You don't need permission from um, complicit university departments that spent half the Cold War taking money working on these projects and then turn around and telling you it's not real. Like, I don't need. I don't need you. <laughs> I no, don't exactly, need your exactly, exactly. And I think there are enough of us out there doing this work. That that's what's kind of the fun bit about where we are in the timeline is that um, the uh, they have lost the mandate of heaven. All of these kind of sources of of authority and truth validation have squandered it and lost the mandate of heaven. Good way to put it. Uh, certainly this is true of so much of the academic uh, literature on, uh, you know, pick your subject. doesn't really matter. Uh, I don't really know who reads these people anymore. First of all, their writing is generally incomprehensible, and uh, that's bad enough. But in fact, I think the, the theories and theses that they have in so many fields, whether it's, uh, uh, I mean, almost, there's no, almost not a single academician who really writes cogently and intelligently about UFOs. Not, not a single academician no. that I can think of. Um, and this is probably also true of, um, of ancient uh, archaeology or, I mean, I'm not, I'm not as conversant, but I would guess it probably are not that many. Do you know, it's funny, I I've been meaning to ask you this, because when Starships came out, I got from about four or five different, um, how many was it? It was four and a half because one of them had just left different sort of anthropology departments around the world. Emails from people going, hey, I read your book. It's fantastic. Like, basically, I'm never going to talk about it. <laughs> but really? what, oh, wow. what occurred to me yeah. was yeah. that there is, and this is sort of the thing about, and it's why I like the idea of being interdisciplinary rather than alternate, is um, even people in academia know that the academic game is nonsense. Oh, and yes. so they have a kind of invisible college thing going on, which is that the ones that are interested in the stuff that we're interested in, Richard, do in fact talk to each other, but it doesn't, it can't, it, you know, for simple economic reasons, I guess, it can't express itself. Uh, and I kind of feel sorry for them because we've never really had that as a uh, as a challenge to overcome, either make money elsewhere and, and, and say what you want. But I don't know if you've had the similar things happen with your books where people yes. in academia have emailed and gone, this is amazing, this is fantastic research. I'm never going to talk about it in my actual job. <laughs> I have absolutely had that happen to me a number of times, absolutely, quite a few times. I once had a department chair at a, a, a prestigious school in uh, the University of California system who called me. He was head of a uh, I think at the time, the political science department, this is about a decade ago, and he 
was telling me how much he enjoyed my book. And at one point, he began whispering into the phone. And uh, I said, thank you very much. Why are you whispering? <laughs> and he said, oh, I didn't realize. I just didn't want any of my colleagues to hear me speaking to you. <laughs> so it was exactly, exactly that type of uh, uh, phenomenon that happens. And uh, I think they do. I think you're right. Academicians, generally speaking, have become very aware. I mean, I still have a number of friends who, who actively teach in the university systems, and they've all said the same thing. It's like, it's not what you thought it was when you started out. Uh, I was going to do that life. That was going to be my world. I wanted to be king of my classroom, teach history at some university. And um, for a variety of reasons, it did not happen. And I look back and I think, thank God it didn't, because uh, it would not have been a life that I wanted and it would not have been the right the right path for me. Uh, I think in your book, in fact, you had a little bit to say about it and you described the academic system or someone described the academic system as a kind of a, a, a slightly different version of uh, drug cartels. Did you recall this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that was actually uh, from Super Free Economics, I think. It's a, the popular economics book uh, that came out. Ah. That, and, and it's because it has the exact same economic structure, which is that there are very few high-status, high-paying positions in the, at the yeah. top of this pyramid. Exactly. And then the next two or three levels down where you do, in fact, get money – isn't enough money to live on, which describes the kind of academic journey to, say, tenure. And then outside that sort of three-tier system, there is an infinite number of people willing to do it for free to try and get on that pyramid. Yeah. And that is the exact model of how drug dealing works. You you start, you decide you want to get into it, you, you sell a few dime bags, and then you're on the street corner. In the street corner, you're not making enough money because you don't get the cut, and you're doing that so that eventually either enough people will die or you're successful at it to move up to getting closer to the dealer or the CIA importing it from Nicaragua or wherever it is these days. Yeah. Uh, and it's only then that you make the real money. And uh, so ac <laughs> the academy is literally structured in the, in the same kind of um, high status, right. small amount of jobs, high demand way. And uh, and that isn't a good that isn't no, a good environment for generating – well, it's just not a good environment for, for, for civilization. Like no, we shouldn't be having people – and I don't just mean UFOs and anthropologists and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean Shakespeare studies shouldn't work like that. No, and it's – right. I think what you're saying is it's not a good environment for, for generating fresh, positive, beneficial ideas no. to, to further human civilization, which ideally we would want the academy for. And uh, it certainly yes. doesn't do that. It certainly does not no. do that. No, it's a shame. So I have a tremendous sympathy for not the ones that are, you know, in some cases um, paid disinfo state operatives, not the ones that are kind of loud mouthed and awfully wrong. But I have tremendous sympathy for people who are trying to operate in that field. And like you, I have a there, but for the grace of God, go I feeling when they tell me about their work because I'm like, no, nah, no, would've. exactly. No, no, sir. No, thank you. <laughs> so, Gordon, we've got about five minutes or so before we have to wrap this up. And I would like to ask you, so do you have a general assessment of where you think humanity is right now in the midst of all of the other uh, intelligences and beings that are around us or that work with us? And uh, where do you think we may be headed? Um, I don't think – it's a great question, actually. I haven't been asked that. Um, I don't think there is much in the way of a difference. What's important to understand about materialism and empiricism and all the rest of it is that 89% of the world's population today – doesn't think it's like they, they have never not had a spirit custom or tradition in some way, shape or form across Asia, across South America, global South, and even ourselves as Europeans and descendants of it. Up until a couple of centuries ago, we lived in a haunted universe of, of spirits and, and meaning and, and so on. So it is just possible that the last couple of centuries, the 5% of people running off on this enlightenment um, materialism idea are wrong given all of mankind for all time everywhere else uh, has headed in, in an opposite direction. So in that sense, I don't think there is a material change in our um, status or, or, or um, interactions with the more than human world. As for where we are as a, as a Western civilization, I think we're, and I probably agree, we're in the process of the next, started a couple of years ago and over the next five or six years of actually bringing some of that 
uh, or, or onboarding some of that breakaway stuff or making it more apparent. And I would be surprised if by 2032 we aren't like officially multiplanetary, although potentially we are. So I think uh-huh. the real story is in over the next decade is in the surfacing of all this stuff that's come out of all those Cold War experiments and retrievals and anything else that's happened. I think we're at the, we're seeing the legal and economic rearrangement of the world to allow that to happen. Okay. We just spent almost two hours talking about ancient aliens and mythos, and you suddenly take us right in to breakaway civilizations being revealed over the next two decades. I really want to talk to you about that some more (laughs) for a future episode because, um, (laughs) You, you caught me off guard there. Yes, I do think that we're moving into this this type of an era where I, I just think it's going to be impossible to continue hiding uh, some of these breakthroughs forever. So uh, multiplanetary civilization, sure. So what about these other, what about the trickster? Where does the trickster uh, fit into all of this? Uh, so th- this is very interesting. Um, you're asking a kind of like proper sort of deep magical question which is is the babel story is the tower of babel story baked into the universe and i think it is and i think uh, the technocratic view which again is being restructured in a way but that sort of technocratic arrogant i will con- like control and monitor and, and surveil all things because i'm i'm smart i'm a scientist thing i actually think baked into the universe that fails so so explain kind of, i mean i think most people know the tower of babel story but explain what you mean here because i'm not quite getting your full i i think the kind of for one of a better word the kind of anglo-american new world order project for mm. a um, a surveilled and hypermanaged technocratic world uh uh-huh. Uh, even if fail. they quote unquote win, they lose. I, I I actually don't think the universe works that way. So uh, I don't think I, I what we're seeing in terms of the rearrangement. I think is uh, some seizing back of uh, like force majeure seizing back of breakaway tech that's probably off planet at the moment back into particularly U.S. military hands. Um, so I don't think we're going to get the exact that, that kind of dare I say Clintonite, but I don't think we're going to get that kind of. Uh, European Union technocratic future that looked like it was going to happen. Uh, it's going to be in pieces, which is good. But yes, I, I think I think the, the drive to total surveillance and total monitoring and digital currencies and so on ultimately destroys itself. And I think that's baked into the universe. So that's the good news, frankly. It's going to be a bouncy ride to 2030, I expect. But um, I, I don't think they win in the end. That's only 12 years from now, people. So buckle up. It's happening. You heard it here. Gordon White uh, had that to say about it. Gordon, I have absolutely loved uh, talking with you about this. Perhaps we can can, uh, carry this conversation uh, to um, Richard Olin members' podcast if uh, you want to stick around for that. Happily. But, but, uh, yes, thank you. But for now, we need to say good night. This has been wonderful. I'm Richard Dolan here with the researcher and author and magician Gordon White, who lives in, uh, I can say, Tasmania, right? Tasmania, yeah, Australia. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll have to talk about that another time. Uh, about his book, Star Ships, A Prehistory of the Spirits, we talked about, well, a complete redefinition of really the whole ancient alien concept and, and I think so much more. Absolutely fascinating. Gordon, it was a pleasure having you on. And people can visit Gordon White's website at runesoup.com. And with that, it's time to say goodnight. Thanks for listening. If you want to hear more follow-up conversation between Gordon and myself, you can go to richarddolanmembers.com, where we will have a candid conversation on UFOs in Australia. And remember, while we learn and grow and search for the truth, let's be good to each other. Good night.